There are three big problems with used vehicle appraisals. One, manually sifting through comp vehicles. Two, old book values and ghost comps. Three, no recon visibility. You can solve them all with AutoVision. Now available from Reynolds and Reynolds. Learn more at reyrey.com slash use dash cars. That's R-E-Y, R-E-Y dot com slash used dash cars. Want to dive deeper into the topics you hear about on Daily Drive? We're offering listeners a special offer, 20% off a one-year automotive news digital subscription. That gets you access to all of our news, information, and analysis made for automotive industry leaders like you. Go to autonews.com slash daily drive promo to redeem. Welcome to Daily Drive for Thursday, February 8th, 2024. I'm Jamie Butters, Executive Editor of Automotive News in Detroit. And I'm Kellen Walker in Las Vegas. Today on the show, we've got earnings from Honda, Nissan, and Subaru. Inventory slips in January for the first time in a year, and Ford looks to an EV strategy to take on Tesla and China. Plus, AutoFi Chief Marketing Officer Kerry Wise joins the show to talk about the rise in online F&I buying. A lot of times we think of digital as it's going to erode profitability. It's going to hurt our chances to sell more because a customer has too much power, too much control. But we find just the opposite. Let's run through all the news you need to know to keep up in the auto industry. Honda's profit climbed by more than a third in the latest quarter. Sales boomed in North America, where a mix of higher margin products such as hybrids boosted the bottom line. The results prompted Honda to lift its forecast for record operating profit this fiscal year. Operating profit increased 35% to just under $2.7 billion. Revenue jumped 21% to more than $38 billion, while global sales increased 24% to 1.2 million vehicles in the quarter. Nissan had a pretty good thing going in the U.S. market during the pandemic and semiconductor shortage, when supply was tight and dealers' lots were empty. Things have changed. Nissan's U.S. sales registered just a 5.6% increase to 202,000 vehicles in the latest quarter. That tally trailed the overall U.S. market's 8.3% increase, not to mention the surge for Honda that Jamie just mentioned and Toyota's soaring sales. Nissan's net income tumbled 42% in the quarter. Operating profit growth was almost stagnant, inching ahead 6% to $1 billion in the period. Meanwhile, Subaru's quarterly profit surged 79%. The upswing puts the automaker on track to reach its best fiscal year earnings in almost a decade. That's as Subaru zeroes in on a double-digit operating profit margin of 10.5%. Net income doubled to more than a billion dollars, compared with about $540 million the year before. Global revenue advanced 21% to about $9.1 billion in the quarter. New vehicle inventory levels slipped by 110,000 in January. That interrupts an 11-month period of sustained growth. Data analytics company Cloud Theory says the last time inventories fell was in January 2023 meaning the slip is probably a normal seasonal fluctuation. Demand also remained stagnant in January with a 40% turnover rate. Ford is talking about its EV strategy and how in the future it will rely less on large, expensive EVs. CEO Jim Farley revealed that Ford is working on inexpensive, small electric vehicles to stem its EV losses and take on Tesla and Chinese automakers. Farley said on the company's earnings call this week that high prices are the biggest barrier to convincing mainstream car buyers to go electric. We made a bet in silence two years ago. We developed a super talented Skunk Works team to create a low-cost EV platform. It was a small group, small team, some of the best EV engineers in the world, and it was separate from the Ford mothership. It was a startup, and they've developed a flexible platform that will not only deploy to several types of vehicles, but will be a large install base for software and services that we're now seeing at Pro. The small team is being led by Alan Clark, Executive Director of Advanced EV Development, who came to Ford two years ago after more than 12 years developing models for Tesla. Farley says Ford's new EV platform will be the basis of several types of vehicles, which he said should generate a profit. 
Ford's current battery-powered models lost $4.7 billion last year, and it projects the losses will grow to as much as $5.5 billion this year. And the UAW is calling on the Biden administration to raise tariffs on imported light-duty vehicles and auto parts. The union says it's concerned about the industry's compliance with the USMCA trade agreement. The U.S. imposes a 25% tariff on light trucks and a 2.5% tariff on imported passenger vehicles and parts from countries with most favored status. The designation provides preferential treatment to some international trade partners. But the UAW argues the tariff isn't strict enough to incentivize auto companies to comply with the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement and prevent Chinese companies from evading other duties and gaining access to the U.S. auto market through Mexico. And those are today's headlines. Jamie, Ford reveals more of their EV strategy. Now they're focused on small electric vehicles. Ford lost $4.7 billion on EVs last year. Will this help Ford get back into the affordable EV race? Well, it helped Ford get into the affordable EV race. Um, right. Yeah, you know, Ford is trying to do what Tesla and Kia and Stellantis and others are trying to do, which is, yeah, get us an affordable, get the market an affordable EV that they can make money on. And that's a lot easier said than done. But if they can do it, that's when the market will really switch, right? If you can make a vehicle that that the automakers can make money on and that saves consumers money by costing less up front and saving them money on gas and maintenance, then like the mass market is going to want to switch to EVs and, and we'll have a real big change. We've got, of course, have the uh, charging infrastructure and all those good things to make it work. But this is the this is the right goal for most of the, the industry. And, and it's good to see that Ford is trying to be in the game. Gotcha. Coming up, we'll hear from AutoFi Chief Marketing Officer Carrie Wise about how digital retail can help not hurt dealership F&I offices. That's next on Daily Drive. Data is the backbone of your used vehicle department. You need it to find accurate comp sets and to best understand your market in order to make precise appraisal and pricing decisions. But it feels like you're always struggling to get the information you need. How much time do you spend sifting through comps because there are outliers that don't match the vehicle you're appraising? Do you frequently make manual adjustments to pricing recommendations? Reynolds' newest inventory management solution, AutoVision, can help. AJ McGowan, president and founder of AutoVision, explains how. If you look at the way that cars are traditionally priced, you know, you can get down to specifics in terms of you know, what zip code is it in and, you know, what options does it have on it? You know, some of those sorts of things. Um, But the thing that's never really taken into account um, is, you know, that dealer's, you know, specific view of the market. Our goal with AutoVision was to use, you know, technology that's available now to do real-time processing, which allows dealers to really set the, their view of the market into AutoVision. And then we use our tools to analyze the data that's there and show them this is what this vehicle is worth to you. AutoVision can help you run your used vehicle department with precise comp sets, real-time inventory data, and reconditioning insights. Visit reyrey.com slash used dash cars to find out more. That's R-E-Y, R-E-Y dot com slash used dash cars. Welcome back to Daily Drive. I'm Jamie Butters with Kellen Walker. Just about every corner of the auto retail business is grappling with how technology can either boost profits or threaten them. That's especially so in the finance and insurance office. Carrie Wise is the chief marketing officer for AutoFi. The digital retailer recently studied how its digital F&I tools are affecting dealerships. I spoke with Wise at the NADA show in Las Vegas. Carrie Wise, welcome to Daily Drive here at the Automotive News booth at the NADA show in Las Vegas. Thank you for having me. It's so exciting and just uh, I feel full of energy on this floor. Well, th- it is. This floor is so full of energy and everyone's having meetings, yeah. representing their companies. What is your mission? What is your message as you're here at this uh, NADA show? Yeah, well, we are excited to launch a brand new product. And really, I should describe it more as an expansion of our platform. Mm-hmm. You many new us as digital retailing. You know, we gave consumers the ability to shop for a car on a dealer's website, calculate a payment, get a trade value, do everything, uh, and then transition into the showroom. But what we found is that 
most people still buy a car in the store. The and omni-channel thing. I, Start online, do your research, yep. but then get in the store to and, put your hands on the car and make sure you want yeah, it. Yeah, the transaction happens in the showroom. And what we found lacking um, in a lot of technology is that we weren't really addressing some of those pain points that dealers are facing in the showroom. So we launched our showroom platform. It's desking, it's deal estimation, it's lender routing, it's F&I menu, all in one platform. And really what we see it as is a way to solve some of these major pain points, you know, mm -hmm. the bottleneck at the desk. Yes. Right? How do we enable either your sales team to do more with some management oversight, right? So that mm -hmm. we don't have that back and forth to the desk. How do we help managers make better decisions? So for example, choosing a lender, you know, we have all the data on any given day on, on the right lender for a manager to send that customer to. And the last problem is that the, this distrust from consumers, you know, as much of the strides we've made in automotive retail, consumers still come in with that chip on their shoulder. And so we see our technology, our new showroom platform as a way to kind of bridge that gap with the customer. So we're really, really excited. Uh, about this showroom platform. You did some interesting research last year, uh, late last year, about F&I penetration in a digital environment compared with the F&I office. What did you find with that? Yeah, and that was looking at our digital retailing at the time. Our okay. showroom platform wasn't out at the, that, that time. But right. we found that on average, our digital customers were choosing about 1.5 F&I products okay. um, on Autify, using the Autify platform. And yeah. when you look at those same set of dealers, uh, they're typically for a non-autify sale, a non-digital sale. They're they're selling about 1.4, 1 1.48 uh, uh, F&I products per customer. Pretty similar. The same, yeah. right? And so what that tells us is a lot of times we think of digital, it's going to erode profitability. Mm -hmm. It's going to hurt our chances to sell more because a customer has too much power, too much control. Uh, but we find just the opposite that. When a customer is more involved, whether that be through self-service through the digital retailing, mm -hmm. or whether that be by involving them more in the negotiation, in the lender selection wall in the showroom, they're more in control of like their payment. They're more aware of what it would be. They're working within their budget. So by the time we actually talk to them about F&I products on the back end, they're willing to actually choose just as much and, and sometimes more than, right. than if, there, if that, that wasn't the case. I know the, I'm sure, you know, highly paid F&I managers believe they are absolutely vital and necessary, mm -hmm. but I know so many consumers, myself included, you know, we go into that F&I office in the defensive crouch. We're like, you know, we're in yeah. the corner in the boxing ring, just trying not to get hurt. You say, you know what, I, I've been in that, that same situation and it's almost like I'm trained to just say no, 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 right. no, no. And I think what ends up happening, it's a really good point you bring up, is that through our digital retail and self-service or even in the showroom, you're allowing the customer to educate themselves, whether they're online, or you're allowing the salespeople, you're arming them with technology to say, let's walk through, let's watch a video on gap insurance, on extended warranty. You're, you're arming them with those talking points on why this is helpful for the consumer. Mm -hmm. And what we're typically finding, particularly in the showroom, is that we have salespeople who haven't sold cars for very long. You know, I know a, a guy that came out of an Amazon warehouse. Now he's selling 25, 30 cars a month. And it's not just because he's an easy learner, he's a fast learner. It's because the technology is mm -hmm. guiding him so that he's consistent in how he presents F&I products. Mm -hmm. He's a consistent in his approach. The technology gives you those guardrails to kind of keep everybody consistent yeah. at, at, as, as a sales team. And so I think that that's really critical. This shouldn't replace people. If you're an F&I director, you shouldn't think of this as a threat. I think of this as an efficiency play. Mm -hmm. How can we move faster? How can we make smarter decisions through technology? Mm -hmm. So with your new platform, yeah. do you have any data on what the F&I shopping is like there? Yeah, I mean, we have a, a lot of data that's just kind of broadly associated to the okay. retail experience. So, for example, we find that the average time it takes from the time you check the customer in, let's say they go on a test drive and they check the customer into the system, through the time that they get a lender decision, they're approved for a loan is 28 minutes. Let me repeat that again, because that right. might be shocking. <laughs> so if we look at our dealers that are using the showroom platform, the average time from the time they check that customer in after they come back from a test drive 
to through the negotiation to lender approval is 28 minutes. You look at the average negotiation to loan approval, that's probably easily an hour and a half. That's easily half mm-hmm. of the three hour purchase experience. So the number one benefit we're seeing is time, that you're able to move cars faster. And more importantly, you're able to present numbers faster. Because we like to say, when a customer comes off of that test drive, that is the most excited the customer is, right? (laughs) They're happy, they love the car, now they're ready to talk numbers and I have to wait for it. So hit them early while they're excited, ready to go while their buying temperature is at its highest peak. (laughs) And you're more likely not only to close that deal, but to hold on growth. So that's number one. The second part is profit. And that ties to the F&I products. We're seeing about $411 more back in profit tied to the F&I products um, when a dealer is using Autofy in the experience versus just their traditional. We're looking at the same set of dealers. Wow. Autofy sales versus non-Autofy sales is an incremental $411 more back in profit. A lot of that's tied to F&I products, consumers choosing those F&I products. But I think it's also just a mindset thing that the customer is a little bit more in control of their own destiny. They're choosing the car that meets their uh, budget. They're choosing the payment that they feel more comfortable with. And you don't have those games being played back and forth to the desk. Well, being able to speed up the process by an hour is going to make the, the retailer more efficient, but it also is going to make for a much happier customer if they can get in and out one hour faster. And that's the other part is customer satisfaction. I always save that to the end because <laughs> I, you know, I'm used to talking to car dealers. They're driven by money and time and all of that. But, but ultimately, you're going to get happier customers, right? And yeah. that, that, there's a lot of benefit for that. And the other thing that we look at is even loan approval rates in our platform is higher. And so here's the example I give. If I gave you a customer right now, and and really I've tested this with a lot of dealers. It's like, this customer has a 680 credit score. Here's their income. What banks should you send that to the customer to? You wouldn't believe how much guesswork goes into like what banks, right? A lot of times we're influenced by the banks we're just comfortable with. Maybe um, they've they've uh, wined and dined us, or sent us on a concert. That may not be the best decision today. What was good a month ago, based on rates changing, might not be the best decision. So we think of our technology similar to when I want to get directions on my phone. I use Google Map. I know how to get there. I, I don't have to use Google Map. But Google Map can tell me what's happening at any given time in terms of traffic. Lenders are the same way, right? We in real time know the rates that are happening based on this credit van and this credit score. These are the banks and we'll send that off, bounce it off and in 60 seconds return back three lenders. And I think that's critical to take the guesswork out some some of these decisions. Autofy is an interesting company, but I also wanted to check in with you about Wokan, the Women of Color Automotive Network, which you co-founded. What's happening with Wokan these days? I mean, Jamie, so much is happening since the last time we talked. I remember when you reached out to us uh, maybe a week after we launched uh, (laughs) and we had probably 20 members at that time. We're close to 900 members now Wow! um, after, I guess that's been about almost uh, three years since we launched. And so it's just been such a beautiful thing to see because we started Bocan and me and my other three co-founders, really for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, The automotive industry is about six to 7% are women of color. So we're probably the most um, least represented group a sector in the industry. Six to seven, not 67. Oh yes, thank you for clarifying. That's (laughs) 6% to 7% in that, based on my calculations. Right. uh, You know, 20% are women. So we're very, uh, we don't have a lot of representation. And so we created the organization for ourselves so we yeah. can find more of us so that we can have our own networks because we have some unique challenges that mm-hmm. are at the intersection of not just gender but also race right and so for us it's been about growing this this uh, organization so that we can grow these networks and not just find women of color but find a woman of color that is a technician mm-hmm or a woman of color that's in tech. And I think we've now grown to a size where women now can kind of find other women that are exactly in their field. Uh, What we have expanded to is scholarships. So we've launched probably 20 plus scholarships where we're sending women of color to events like this. 
we're helping them in, with, with the tools that they need to advance their career, whether that be training, whether mm -hmm. that be tools if you're a technician. It's been really important for us to be intentional mm -hmm. in helping these women level up uh, in their careers. Uh, and the last thing is, is education. That's going to be our new focus. We actually just um, partnered uh, with Solera who is going to be helping us launch a leadership Our neighbors academy right there, right next Solera, to you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and so it's really been important for us to find corporate sponsors like that that yeah. support us. Solera in particular has a leadership academy they have internally that we're now going to offer free of charge to wow. our members. It's a six month program. Nice. And for us, that's really important because I said 6% of uh, the automotive industry is women of color. If you go to a leadership level, I'm a unicorn. You better yeah. capture me and make sure you keep me <laughs> safe, okay? And part of that is that there's this playbook on how to navigate automotive. There's training that I have been really blessed and luckily to receive in the corporations I've been in, like leadership training. Many of our members don't have access to that. Right. And so we feel really proud um, to work with partners like Solera, um, other companies like Chase and Cars.com and um, Nissan and Kia and these companies at Cox Automotive um, that are going to be helping us. You don't want to forget offer, any of those oh key God, partners. You'd be in trouble. Nervous. I almost <laughs> forgot someone that are really helping us and supporting us financially to help us offer these programs to our members. Well, that's great. I'm glad to hear yeah. about the latest progress. Carrie Wise, Chief Marketing Officer for Autofy and a co-founder of Wocan. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. I appreciate all your support. That's Daily Drive for today. I'm Jamie Butters. And I'm Kellen Walker. Thanks to Automotive News Coordinating Producer Jake Neer, as well as our own Hans Grimo, Nauto Akamura, George Wycamp, and Aji LaForest for their reporting for today's podcast. You can get the latest news on finance and insurance, earnings results, and everything happening in the auto industry at autonews.com. Come back tomorrow for a conversation with Lee Harkins, CEO of dealership service training company, M5 Management Services, about what service departments should be focused on in 2024. There ain't a service department out there that wants to be the reason why their store gave up a ton of money because their net promoter was bad. If you enjoy the podcast, remember to like, leave a review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode.